Hi everyone, welcome to this class. It's called Introduction to Epidemiology. I'm Geraldine Cambron and I'm your course instructor. To get started, you will need to order the textbook called Epidemiology by Leon Gordis. The fourth and fifth edition are very similar and so I would encourage you to get either of those. Um, and we will definitely be going through and reading this course text. And so uh, this is not one of those textbooks that you can get out of and not purchase for the course. You really will need this book. So let's start out by talking about what is epidemiology. This is something that we've all heard of and uh, on the news and anytime there's an outbreak, but really epidemiology is the study of how disease is distributed in populations and the factors that influence or determine this distribution. And so really what we're doing is we're studying disease. How does it start? Where does it spread? What factors might be um, associated with the disease? And we're just uh, trying to follow it forward and look backwards and, and really better understand it uh, within the different populations of the world. There's another definition that I found. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events in specific populations and the application of this study to control of health problems. So this uh, definition really kind of goes more into health. Epidemiology can also study health factors, what things are actually good for you rather than what things are bad for you. So when we talk about epidemiology, usually we think of uh, chasing down bugs such as uh, malaria or Zika or uh, things such as that. Um, but really, it can be studying any type of factor that influences health. If we look at the different objectives of epidemiology, the first one is to identify the cause of disease and the relevant risk factors. And so when we look at the different risk factors, some are controllable and some are uncontrollable. So just like it says, the uncontrollable ones are factors that we really don't have any control over. Factors that we're born with, such as gender, race, age, well, we're born at zero, but you know, as time goes on, we, we don't have any control over uh, turning back time. Family history, such as genetics, so things like that, we really, we can't change about ourselves. But there is just a whole slew of controllable risk factors. Uh, those risk factors include things such as smoking or alcohol intake, uh, different leisure activities, exercise, what you eat, um, fruits and vegetables. All of the things that we do in life can potentially be risk factors for either disease or for health. When I first saw this graphic, I thought it was so funny, and it just has never gotten less funny to me. Um, this is a comic called The Random Medical News, and what this is is you can spin the first circle to come up with, well, you know, what is the risk factor and then can cause, and you spin the next wheel, and those are all the different disorders. And then the third wheel, you say in, and you spin that wheel, and it's the different populations. Sometimes this is exactly what it feels like when we hear the news. So fatty foods can cause hypothermia in children. <laughs> um, I remember back in the 90s when uh, butter was good, but then butter was bad, and margarine was good, and margarine was bad. And you know, throughout time, we've had these factors. And I think that uh, a lot of nutrition studies have this problem where it just keeps going back and forth. But there's a lot of different risk factors where sometimes it's bad, and sometimes it's good. And in some populations, it's bad, and some it's good. But again, I, I thought this comic was um, appropriate at this point, and, and it still makes me laugh. So I thought I would share that with you. The second objective of epidemiology is to determine the extent of disease found in the community. So really we're looking at um, perhaps two different things here. One is the first graph on the left is looking at the amount of disease as it uh, kind of climbs over the years. This is Lyme disease, which has grown over the years, uh, as you see in that graph. The second uh, chart that you see here, a figure, is on the right-hand side. These are the reported cases of Lyme disease. Uh, both of these 
are um, about Lyme disease, but they, they really focus on different aspects. The first one is the total amount of, of people with Lyme disease, and the second one being where it's actually located and how far it has spread. And so when we look at the extent of disease, we really could be talking about either of these factors. The third objective of epidemiology is to study the natural history and prognosis of the disease. So natural history means um, what would happen with the disease over time if we did not intervene at all. And so it's just, you know, historically speaking, as this disease naturally progresses forward, what does it look like? And prognosis means um, what is the outcome? And so this is a, uh, a graph of Parkinson's disease. And, and when I think of that, I think of Michael J. Fox. So he has nothing to do with this study. I just thought I'd throw his picture in there. Uh, but really what this graph is showing us is uh, four different factors that are affected with uh, Parkinson's, working, walking unaided, dwelling independently, and the ability to drive. And so what we see is that um, at the point of diagnosis, if we look at the bottom one, that is the working. And so we have about 20% uh, of the population of people who have Parkinson's disease are actually working. Now this might be um, because they're retired, because this is a, a disease that uh, shows up in older folks, or perhaps because at the time of diagnosis, they were already having severe health problems and therefore weren't able to work. And that uh, number goes down. But if we look at the other ones, um, at the point of diagnosis, there's much higher levels of capabilities, uh, such as walking unaided. We see that at a very high percent, but by 10 years, it has really significantly dropped. Um, and so really, when we look at the natural history or the prognosis of Parkinson's, over the course of about five to 10 years, people's capability to function normally significantly drops off. And that is part of epidemiology, is to study things like this. The fourth objective is to evaluate both existing and newly developed preventative and therapeutic measures and modes of healthcare delivery. And so when we look at um, you know, what's going to help us, what will keep us healthy, uh, sometimes we might think of, again, nutrition and things such as our diet. Um, we can also think of, okay, what types of things might help us not get certain other diseases? So instead of thinking about our diet leading to obesity, we might think of obesity leading to other diseases such as high blood pressure or stroke. And so all of this really ties together uh, when we measure the different um, types of, of diets, we have to compare them to one another. They're all very different. And so we have to evaluate some of the new ones compared to some of the old ones to see which, which is best. Uh, again, I remember back in the 90s when they had the very low salt diet. Um, and you know after that, then Weight Watchers was very popular and Atkins came around. Uh, and, and throughout the years, we've had so many different types of diets, and we really still to this day don't know which ones are the best or which single one is the best. But I suppose it depends on which factor we're interested in, whether it be obesity or blood pressure or just general health or you know any other factor. So this is all epidemiology is to look at these types of um, issues. The fifth objective of epidemiology is to provide the foundation for developing public policy relating to environmental problems, genetic issues, and other considerations regarding disease prevention and health promotion. There's so many different factors that um, can drive public policy, and one of them is truly research that's out there. And so there's uh, lots of environmental toxins that it have been discovered to affect the population's health, and that type of information can then um, move up into our government where the government then starts to regulate those types of uh, toxic factors. So things such as uh, lead in our water uh, is, 
you know, we, we have our government measure the amount of lead in our water and there's certain limits that are allowable. And if our water um, has higher limits than what's allowable, then fines happen and, um, you know, people in schools and uh, water plants can get into big trouble with that, just uh, like what happened in Detroit. And so it's, uh, it's very important to get research in epidemiology so that we better understand the different factors within our environment and its effect on our health in order to help that drive public policy. So there's several different public health organizations that I would like you to become familiar with. The first is the uh, CDC, which you probably have heard of, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's not CDCP because the end prevention was added um, most much more recently than just the Centers for Disease Control. It used to be all about disease, but after a certain point, the uh, government decided, you know what, we're not just about disease, we want to be focused on health as well. And so end prevention was added to CDC's name. The American Public Health Association is a very, very large organization uh, within the United States. So APHA, when uh, APHA has um, conferences it's not just in one convention center, usually it spans a convention center plus several hotels because it's massive. There's thousands and thousands of people who come to this type of convention. And then there's the World Health Organization. So this is an organization that oversees public health on more of a world basis. So I've included these different websites. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at these different websites and, and become a little bit more familiar with them. So finally, I just want to say happy studying. You guys got this. This is going to be a fun class and hopefully an interesting class. I look forward to working with you. If you have any questions at all, please just let me know and uh, happy studying.